Today, I'm at Tunnel Barn Farm in Warwickshire. It's one of my favourite venues and it's absolutely stuffed full of fish, but that doesn't mean they're easy to catch. It gets a lot of pressure from match anglers all through the year and these fish have been caught a few times. Um, there's a lot of methods you can use to catch these fish though, and I'm going to show you one that I think is absolutely deadly. Right, let's put the rig out of the way. Right, the method I want to talk about today is something called dobbing. Now, it's a very, very strange term, but it's a deadly winter tactic. The main thing I'm going to be dobbing with is this stuff, bread. It doesn't come any simpler than that. Um, there are some other baits we can use. I can show you them in a bit, but it's bread, specifically big punches of bread, that's going to catch me most of my fish today, I hope. Now, dobbing, as an expression, it can refer to several things. In winter, what I mean by dobbing is suspending a bait off the bottom for torpid carp, carp that aren't really feeding. We're not feeding anything with this other than our hook bait. Now, dobbing in the summer is a little bit different. You could be using a great big disc of bread, fishing it right on the surface, chucking it into a reed bed or something and catching great big carp. It's a deadly tactic. Perhaps I'll show you that another time. And the other um, form of dobbing is casting a bait to cruising fish in the summer and just fishing through the water. I've, I've had some big weights doing that with hair rig meat and things like that, but, but that's a summer tactic and it's still called dobbing, but the winter dobbing is what I want to talk about the most. And believe you me, it'll blow your mind if you've never done it before. Right then, now I know you're not fishing anywhere near the bottom but you still need to know where the bottom is else you haven't got a clue where to gauge what depth it is and you know how deep off the bottom you are. So always have a plumb up. You might even feel some fish on certain days, you might even be able to feel where a ball of fish is, is holding up. Just Obviously I wouldn't drag the plummet around too much to scare them. But I mean, I've set this about four foot, a lot deeper than I'd expect to fish. And you can see there, it's about three or four inches shallower than that, in that area. And I'm just gonna have a quick rough plumb around the rest of the peg, a couple of inches shallower there. It's all about just getting a good picture of the contours of the peg, all the likely looking holes. There, it goes a bit deeper there. And it starts going back again. Up there, I'm imagining. It's not always the case, you might even find a hole. Yeah, it's going back a deeper there. So, I've got a rough idea of how deep it is now. And obviously, if you're gonna stop dobbing and you wanna start fishing normally on the bottom, then obviously you need to know what these depths are anyway. So, it's quite, it's quite flat around that reed bed. If I shallow up my float another three inches, I think I'd have it dead right. So, I'm just going to move my float down. I would say that's about the depth, and I would generally mark that on my pole, and then anywhere from there to full depth is what I'm going to be fishing. Right, let's ship out and uh, show you how it works. Now, the theory behind this, I've said before, it's all about fishing for fish that aren't really feeding. They're just sitting there, backing away from the anglers, all the commotion on the bank, and they're just shoaling up, getting some warmth. And if you can find where they've shoaled up, where these fish have balled up, you can have a real red letter day. I mean, I've seen 100 pound weights plus of this. I've done 100 pound weights myself. It, it's not the be all and end all though. You could just catch, I don't know, half a dozen fish at the start of the session, but that's half a dozen fish you probably wouldn't have caught when you were just fishing for pellet, with pellets and maggots, you know, and trying to build a swim. You're actually fishing completely unfed areas of your, of your peg, what I call safe areas or where the fish feel safe. But if you can drop a piece of bread or another dobbing bait right in front of their noses, you can plunder them before they know what's happened.
The main thing with it is trying to work out the correct depth to fish. You're not fishing on the bottom. So like today, I've got a swim that's between three and four foot deep. Those fish could be anywhere. They could be 10 inches deep. They could be three inches off the bottom or somewhere in between. And if you don't get that right, you're not necessarily going to catch them. You might foul look them or you won't get a bite at all or you'll just miss bites. Getting that depth is the absolute key to getting this method right once you've found the fish. I think that's an F1. But sometimes you never know, it could be a great big calf. And I'll show you a bit later on my rigs and, and my theory behind my rigs because these fish don't bolt off when you hook them. They're really slow, sluggish, torpid fish that aren't really feeding and that's why it works so well. I think it is an F1 though this time. Yeah. I'll net this fish and I'll talk you through my rigs. Straight in the net. And a pound, pound and a bit. Just about get it without the scourge yet. There you are, not a bad fish. Right, let's have a look at the rig. Starting from the very top, I'm using Preston 9 hollow elastic. Now that's the lightest grade that they do. Some people might argue that's too soft for carp fishing, but I've caught fish to 10 pound on this. And when you're catching F1s down to 12 ounces as well, I think it's perfect. These fish aren't swimming fast through the peg or anything. So they're, they're just lying there. And when you hook them, you don't want them to bolt off. You just want them to slowly arc out the peg and hopefully they won't spook the rest of your, the rest of the shoal mates. You also don't want them coming to the top. So that nice soft elastic just absorbs any sort of quick lunges and uh, really cushions the rest of the rig, which is quite light really. Going down the line, I'm using 014 Drennan Suplex. Now, technically that's a real line but I use it for a lot of my pole rigs and I really, I, I can't fault it really. I use it in 014 and 016 diameters for most of my pole rigs these days and it works a treat. Now I've got between float and connector, I've got about 18 inches to two foot of line. That's, that's quite a lot, but at this time of year, the water's a bit clear. I do like to keep the pole tip away from the, from the float and away from the fish as much as possible. So I've also got a single number eight back shot. I might put one, two, or even three on there, um, depending on how gusty it is. But today it's pretty calm, but I just need to take up any sort of slack line there to stop my rig being blown out of the way. That's because I'm using a very light float. In this instance, it's a 4B11 Mitt Wilkinson Slim. It takes four number 11s, of which most of the shot, I tend to just leave directly below the wire stem. Now the wire stem is important, that helps the float cock straight away, it's working for you straight away and unlike a carbon stem, it, it's much more stable and it will sit there and when you've got skim and any sort of wind, you just want your float and rig working straight away. So it's a slim body, I always prefer slim body floats as much as possible. I don't like round body floats, I don't see any need of them when you're fishing venues that are only five, six foot deep. Um, and the bristle itself is important, that's a hollow bristle. Now that's important because bread, once it's swelled up with water, it becomes a heavy bait and you need that buoyancy from that hollow tip. And I also like to leave a bit of bristle showing, especially with like reed beds or any sort of variable reflection that you get at this time of year. It's important to be able to see that bristle and read the bite. You can't do that with a thin bristle. As I said before, I've got 90% of the shot below the float and then just going down the line I've got one or two number 12s or number 11s, in this instance they're number 12s down the line. That's just out, the hook bait sink can help the line break the surface tension. It's not really acting on the float believe it or not. I, all I want is a pretty much of a free fall of the hook bait down through the water and hopefully I can fall more fish that way. So it's not a bulk down sort of rig this, I'll only bulk the shot down if conditions are bad. Now, the last dropper, although I've got a six inch hook length, the last dropper, I like to have it about eight to 10 inches away. That just keeps everything nice and well away from the hook and just helps present that natural hook bait again. And the hook length itself is 010 or 012. Now, generally I fish an 012 hook length for this time of year. Um, 010 if it's rock hard or if I'm just catching F1s. 
Um, 012, I can catch a 10 pound carp on 012 hook length, no problem. The hook itself is either an 18 gamma pellet or an 18 camera Zambino and 11 F1. They're both very fine hooks. The F1 hook is just that little bit smaller if I'm using a smaller bit of punch. Um, if I talk about the punches straight away, just bring the tub up. I'm using mostly six and seven mil brass headed punches. You get a lovely compression with those. Seven mil is my favorite size. I know a lot of people use sixes, but seven just seems dead right for, for the way I fish. People do use these punches right up to like 10 or 11 mil. Um, I tend to find seven mil is absolutely perfect for F1s and carp. So that's what I tend to stick with. Should put that down. Oh, and the only other thing to mention is I do use an external puller kit as well. Um, that just helps me tension. Obviously I'm using very, very light elastic and I can just negate that at this end and help get the fishing quicker regardless of what size they are. So that's the rig, let's get fishing. Now I've already had some fish on this method today, but what I've already noticed is you're catching one fish and then straight after you're catching a small nuisance roach. Um, to me that's telling me it's not going to be the be all and end all today. This is, I'm going to catch a few fish on it and then I'm probably going to have to try other methods. Um, it's going to case of dropping it into different like looking areas but at the moment I seem to be catching one fish. If I drop it in the same area again, oh there's a good fish there. <laughs> Too eager there. Come on. Yeah. Right, let's talk about the bait. Now, as I said, it's a really, really simple method, and there's one thing I use more than anything else, and that's Warburton's Toasty Bread. And that's the thickest sliced bread they do. It's just the perfect consistency for commercial carp. Whereas I'd use the medium slice for roach fishing, when it comes to carp, use the toasty thick slice. Um, that's obviously the smaller loaf. You're not using a lot of bait with this method, just two or three slices that can last you five hours. Um, you can get a lot of hook baits out of one slice of bread, obviously. Now, I generally just use it straight out of the bag. Um, but obviously, if you're only using three or four slices, there's no point buying a loaf of bread each time just for three or four slices. So I do tend to batch them up into small hook bait size bags and just pop them in the freezer. And then just the night before a session, that's what I bring out. And by the morning that will have defrosted. Now the one thing, little tip I can give you there is when these have defrosted, they go a bit drier and then you lose a lot of the freshness um, when the water, the water gets wicked out in the defrosting stage. So just pop them in the microwave on a plate, three or four slices, put it on full power, 30 seconds, and it will just bring back that moisture and make them a little bit tackier. And that can make a massive difference when you're chipping out 13, 14 meters with a seven mil punch on the end. It just stays on that little bit longer. So that's the main bait I'm using today. There are some other options when it comes to dobbing. It's not just for bread. And they are sweet corn and maggots. They're my two other, two other hook baits. Two maggots can work really, really well, especially when there's no silver fish in the peg causing you any problems and especially when you're after F1s and just some venues you'll find maggot works better than bread you might find corn works better. Um, two red maggots I find creates a nice silhouette against the sky that's my theory anyway and um, I think they, they stand out really well but two white maggots obviously looks a bit closer to bread so I bring both whites and reds and you can just vary it on the day. Some days that will outfish bread and I've proved that here at Tunnel Barn before. The other bait is corn. Now corn on its own is a very heavy bait, obviously, but what I do, I always hook the, hook the corn and then just squeeze out in the middle to leave a skin. And one or two of those on the hook, just corn skins, 
just squashed on the hook. That creates a lovely big focal yellow bait, but there's actually nothing to it. So it really, really wafts through the, through the swim. And when you're getting roached out, corn is an excellent bait for that. So there are the three baits, maggots, corn, main one, thick sliced bread. Okay, I've just had a fish on there. I'm gonna go back in the same hole and see if I can get another bite. If I can, you can sometimes get runs of like two, three, four fish and then you'll have to just drop it somewhere else. It might be just a foot away, or it might be, you know, at a 45 degree angle up to another feature or a likely looking hole. At the moment, I say my peg's about three and a half foot deep where I'm fishing, and I'm presenting a hook bait about two foot deep. It seems about right at the moment, but I'm not really getting enough fish or indications to tell me if, if that's the optimum depth or not today. Normally, after two or three hours, you will, you will have a depth that you've caught 90% of your fish at, and that's where they are. I mean, I do fish a very light rig with this method, and I like it to fall through the layers really, really invitingly. But sometimes, you need to sus just suspend it at the depth you think they are, and by the time it's settled, you might wait two or three seconds, and then it'll go under. I don't know if they're watching it, then inspecting it, and then wondering if they're to take it, and then they take it or what, but it just seems you get that two or three second delay and then wallop, it buries. And that's settled now. We'll just see if we can get an indication. Sometimes not getting indications is actually a very good thing because it just means the nuisance roach have backed off and hopefully a carp or a good quality fish of some description has pushed them out. Now I've caught barbel doing this, chub, F1s, carp, it's mostly proper carp that you want when you're doing this method. You know, mirrors and commons, that's, they're your weight builders. But it definitely works for F1s, and I've caught a lot of fish here at Tunnel Barn Farm, fishing bread for F1s. Just twitch it up three or four inches. If that doesn't go under in the next few seconds, I'm just gonna lift it straight out again and drop it a few feet to the right. Well, the fish definitely have backed off as I expected them to today. I mean, I'm the only one on the lake. And in my experience, this method works best in match conditions. The more anglers on the bank, the better, because that rounds the fish up into quieter, safer areas. And if everyone's feeding around you and you're not, and you dob, you can really catch well. I've just added my dolly put section. <laughs> Just to go a little bit further up that reed bed, and bang, I've caught straight away. And it's amazing, just, just half a metre further, and that's all it takes to stay in touch with these fish. I bet you I can probably catch two more fish there, and then I'll probably have to put my 16 metre section on and chase even further. But whilst I'm doing that, they could always be going the opposite way, and I can always go up to this right hand reed bed and try and catch them there. I mean, I suppose I am making it look quite easy, and it is an easy method. But it's a very, very viable match method, and it does work really, really well, whether it's maggots, corn, or bread. It's not often it'll work all match. If it is, if it does, then you're gonna, you're gonna have a serious weight on your hands. I mean, if this was a match today, I think I would have only caught half a dozen fish on this and then perhaps dropped on it every now and again. It's not quite happening quite as fast as I would have wanted um, for me to be rubbing my hands together and thinking, oh, it's gonna, I'm gonna have 100 pound or so, you know. But when weights are like 20, 30, 40, perhaps 50 pound in winter, you know, 10 fish on this, and you've got 15, 20 pound at this venue. 
And if you are going to catch a bonus common or mirror carp, this is the method to do it. Yeah, just adding that half extension has just put me back in touch with those fish. Another good F1. No commons or mirrors today. It doesn't surprise me. I think they are the most cautious fish and they're the ones that are gonna, are gonna back right off today when you're the only guy on the lake. The more people on the lake, the better for this. Yeah. Just goes to show that you can just have a load of fish on a single slice of bread. I think seven mil punch again that's my favorite size and that's the size that's been working the best today now I do like to give it a bit of a squeeze before I do anything before I um, punch it um, just it's a big bit of punch it can be very buoyant and it might not always sink um, another little tip I'll just squeeze the very bottom of it and that's often enough just to help it to sink as well. Now, I've actually shallowed up to about 15 inches now. I started missing quite a few bites. And I just felt the fish were higher up than what I was fishing. And, well, that's brought those last two fish. I'm guessing I'm doing something right. And as long as the float's going under, the last it's coming out, that's all the indication I need. I've just chucked it a little bit closer to the reeds now. A little bit tricky to see the float with the sun and the reed stems, which is exactly why I said you need that thicker float bristle. It's a big heavy bait. Once that water soaks up into the bread, it does add some weight and you just need some float to, to be able to see. I can't see any point darting it down to a pimple when it's like this. Let's give it a twitch. Perhaps they are a bit deeper than, you know, some days you will find yourself, you catch a fish at 15 inches and you have to fish two foot and you have to fish three or four inches off the deck. And it's just a case of working up and down in the water column. I missed a bite there, so they're not exactly having it today, but it is working. Well, I think I'm going to try and catch just one or two more fish, and then I think we'll call it a day. I mean, it is winter. The knights are drawing in there. I wouldn't mind going home for a bite to eat. Something to warm me up, to be honest. <laughs> as nice as it is to catch like this. Two slices of bread. Ooh. I don't know actually, you might not be able to get me off my box. That's how instant it is. Ship in, float cocks, two seconds, and wallop it's under. It is an easy, easy method when, when you get just a few basics right. Nice light float, right size of punch, right depth, right location. this is what you can catch. I mean a lot of people don't think you can dob for F1s and I think today's proved that you can. Look at that.
I think this is the last fish of the day. Oh, got a bit eager on shipping then, I think. Where's my landing net gone? Come on. Yes. Right. Well, I think that ends a pretty good session on a really, really easy method. Hopefully, you'll be able to give it a try and uh, see how easy it is for yourself. Let's see what we've caught. So there we are, about 25, 30 pound of F1s. Every single fish on bread. There's about two slices worth there. I think that's a brilliant method, if I do say so myself. I mean, when you can catch fish like that, you can't argue with it, can you? Go on, let's tip these back. Everyone a swimmer. <laughs> <laughs>